Stock. My name is Jordan Engel. I'm the coordinator for the festival. Um, this is a wonderful turnout on this beautiful Saturday morning. Um, Bookstock takes place in a small village in rural Vermont, and uh, I think we punch way above our weight um, uh, the quality that has developed over the 11 years of Bookstock. But we couldn't do it without the support of the community, and there are a few names here, but please bear with me, because I, I want to give these people some recognition for the support that they do give us. Um, one of the things that we provide for a number of authors and poets who come here from out of town is um, we try to help them, uh, we try to provide lodging for them. And the inns in the community have been wonderful in, in providing rooms for our authors and poets. Um, those inns are the Ardmore Inn, the Charleston House, Sleep Woodstock, the Deerbrook Inn, the Quality Inn in Queechee, the Shire in Woodstock, the Fan House in Barnard, the Woodstocker B&B, &B. Um, and we have some corporate, uh, some business help from the Yankee Bookshop, Casella Waste Systems, and the Daily Catch Restaurant. Oh, I forgot the Woodbridge Inn. And uh, local organizations that are integral in, in helping, um, in, in putting on the festival. The Norman Williams Public Library, the Woodstock History Center, Artistry, uh, the North Universalist Chapel Society, St. James Episcopal Church, the March Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park, the Thompson Senior Center, Pentangle Arts, of course, which provides us this lovely auditorium. Uh, Change the World Kids, the Woodstock Masonic Lodge, the Adequity Health Foundation, and of course, the town and the village of Woodstock. So, um, yeah, yeah, excellent, yes. Uh, so this morning um, is our uh, uh, annual keynote address. Uh, before um, uh, the keynote address, I'd like to introduce Peter Romanier, uh, one of the founders of, Woodst of Bookstock um, 11 years ago, who will um, present our first annual literary award. Thank you. So. so after 10 years, we grew up and we decided to celebrate literary excellence throughout Vermont by introducing a new award for the first time the Vermont Literary Inspiration Award for outstanding inspiration for the literary prosperity and traditions of Vermont. And for the first year, the planning committee of Bookstock decided unanimous, unanimously to make this award to the Green Writers Press of, of Brattleboro. The Green Writers Press has published dozens of Vermont authors, and not only published them, but has adhered to the highest standards of environmental uh, uh, protection in the publication of books. Um, we have the opportunity of Rose uh, Alexander Leach, who is a senior editor uh, at the Green Writers Press, to, to accept the award and to make a few remarks. Rose? Here you are. Good. And to, not to encumber you, I will take it down and hold it for you while you say your remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank you, Peter. Hi. My name's Rose. Um, I'm an editor at Green Writers Press. Um, Dee Dee Cummings, who is our publisher, is the person that should be here because she's a one woman. Oh, closer. Sorry. How's that? Good? Okay. Um, so Dee Dee Cummings is our publisher, and she's the person who should be here right now because she's a one-woman amazing show of getting everything done. Um, but she's on the West Coast right now with her family um, and couldn't make it, but I know that she would love to be here um, to catch up with all of you because she probably knows most of you, right? Half, at least. <laughs> um, and chat about your families and gardens and what books you're reading. and. Um, yeah, that's what makes her a lovely person and also what makes her a great publisher. Um, so I have a quick note uh, that Dee Dee passed along to me that I will pass along to you. Um, so this is from Dee Dee uh, from California. 
Uh, it is a thrill to be a publisher of words and to work with artists and designers, publicists and editors to bring those words and images to the printed and digital page. And now we have an audiobook division. Uh, it is hectic and crazy and busy, but it is also joyful. And Rose, please tell everyone at Bookstock that I am never going to retire. <laughs> uh, there's just so much energy at our little office um, on my Main Street in Brattleboro, Vermont. At Green Writers Press, our vision is that collectively, our books, your words, will become a chorus of voices of writers and readers, artists and photographers, all who care about the fate of the earth and want to do something about it. We started out with the belief that our books would be interesting to Vermont residents, and now Green Writers Press and our imprint, Green Place Books, has national and international distribution. Our voices need to be heard, which is why we refer to our press as a global press. We are, we all are, connected um, on this planet we love. I and everyone involved with Green Writers Press is so happy to receive this honor, and we want to thank you all. Uh, from Dee Dee, please leave the folks at Bookstock with this quote from climate activist Greta Thunberg. The one thing we need more than hope is action. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So, thank you. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Jordan introduced or told you about some of the organizations that have helped support Bookstock over the years, and I would like to also mention four foundations that have helped us tremendously. The Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, the Pauline Davenport Children's Fund of the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, and the Woodstock Learning Lab. Without their help, we would have a hard time, so they're much appreciated. I have the pleasure of introducing Marcelo. When Marcelo Gleiser was 17, he announced he wanted to get, hello, a physics degree. He was thinking of Einstein, Bohr, Newton, the pioneers, the visionary geniuses, that was the kind of physics that impressed him, the science that unveiled nature's hidden secrets that engaged with the mystery of existence. But his father said, are you crazy? Do you even know a real physicist? And who is going to pay you to count stars? Marcelo Gleiser is professor of physics and astronomy at Dartmouth College. He has recently been awarded the Templeton Prize valued at 1.1 million British pounds. The prize is awarded annually to a person who has made an exceptional contribution to affirming life's spiritual dimension, whether through insight, discovery, or practical works. The Templeton Prize was first awarded to Mother Teresa and given in recent years to the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Born in Brazil, Gleiser is the first Latin American recipient. Professor Gleiser embodies the values that inspired John Templeton to establish the Templeton Prize, the pursuit of joy in all aspects of life, and the profound human experience of awe. And just as an aside note, in my conversation with Marcelo, that comes through profoundly with this individual. He's just a marvelous human being. Marcelo came to Dartmouth in 1991. His work is multifaceted. He's authored 14 books, has been a commentator on numerous TV programs, has posted more than 400 entries on NPR's Cosmos and Culture blog, written more than 900 weekly columns for Brazil's largest newspaper, as well as 100 peer-reviewed articles 
for scientific journals. Marcelo Gleiser is also a runner who, tra who trains for ultra marathons. He believes long distance endurance running on trails is not just a form of moving meditation, but is really a form of worship. The deeper I go, and this is a quote, the deeper I go into the woods, I feel I am getting lost in a realm that is much bigger than I am. In 2016, Gleiser founded the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth. He hopes that the new light directed on his work by the Templeton Prize will allow him to secure long-term funding for the Institute, which he considers the very heart of the liberal arts. I feel like the classroom need not be my several dozen Dartmouth students, Marcello says, but could actually be the entire world. I think he's on his way. The Institute's open line courses have already reached 20,000 participants in 120 countries. It's amazing. And if you want to read further an interview by, um, for, with Marcelo, please look at, I'm looking here at the top. Um, from the seven days, this article appeared May the 8th, uh, 2019, and it was an interview by Jim Schley, Schley, who will be at the UU Church this afternoon. And at the end, if the signing will not be below here, but will be by the books at the front door, give a warm welcome to Marcelo Gleiser. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I was very worried that nobody would show up because it's such a nice day out there and there are so many books to buy at the green that uh, it was hard for me to get in here, but, um, but I made it. And Pam, thanks for that lovely introduction, really. You captured pretty much everything um, I had to say. I have very little to say to you guys, uh, um, but I'll try. And let me understand, so I speak for 45 minutes, is that the plan? And then Q&A? Q&A is the best part, at least for me. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, well, thanks for having me. I'm very, very honored to be part of this. I obviously, not just by being a scientist, but being a writer, I have tremendous respect and love for books. So um, it is very nice to know that books are not a species that is on the way to extinction, quite the opposite. I think they're here to stay. The codex is an amazing technology. You know, this information that you just put between two hard covers is just wonderful. And it's so portable, it doesn't need to be recharged, it doesn't break down. You know, it's just, it's just a wonderful thing. So I'm a big fan. But today, um, I wanted to talk to you about boundaries. And boundaries between the visible and the invisible, between the known and the unknown, between the certain and the mysterious. Now, I have promised some very young friends they're sitting way on the back that I would start with a ghost story, which is a funny thing for a theoretical physicist to do, but um, at this point in life, I can't afford it, you know, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so, this is a story that I tell in this book called The Simple Beauty of the Unexpected that was published by the unfortunately now defunct UPNE. So um, it's going to have to find a new house for it. But it's called The Witch of Copacabana. As you know, I grew up in Rio and Brazil. And as a 17-year-old boy, I had to study very, very hard for the university entry exams there. It was really tough, very different from the SATs here in the US. Basically, the way it works down there is that you have to learn every subject. Doesn't matter what you're gonna do, you have to learn every subject in depth from European history to genetics, to algebra, to trigonometry, 
to sell our biology, and you have to learn all these things, and then you have an exam that everybody takes, and you choose which university you want to go to, and it's very competitive. And I had the fortune and misfortune at the same time of having two older brothers that are both brilliant, and both you know, got into this uh, exam high up, so the pressure was enormous in my case. So I was studying for this, and uh, my father once announced, my father was a dentist, a very superstitious dentist, let's say. He was so superstitious that he used, to put, he used to put garlic on his front pocket, and he would walk with it all the time, with the garlic, you know, a little bit of garlic on his pocket, just in case, he said, you know, okay, fine, you know. You never know, right? And, and, and one thing you need to understand is that Brazil, in many ways, is very similar to the U.S., but in many ways is very different from the U.S. You know, in the similar bits is that, you know, Columbus came here in 1492, the Portuguese came to Brazil in 1500, so eight years afterwards, and when they both got here and there, they found a bunch of natives, they're already there, many, many, many hundreds, perhaps thousands and thousands of years before the Europeans arrived, and Brazil had slavery, just like here, and the difference is that in Brazil, we were colonized by a Catholic culture mostly. And with the Catholic culture, there is a lot of joining of different ways of thinking about God. So the Africans, when they came, they had their religions. And then in Brazil, we had ours. And then this thing developed in Brazil, which is a very strange kind of... Um, it's a little bit like the voodoo, you know, in the Caribbean. But not, we don't have any dolls that we stick pins to, but we do have these very powerful religious rituals in pretty much all over Brazil where these ladies, it's a matriarchal structure in this religion, which is very, these ladies, they receive the spirits of the dead, right? And they're very special, they're the, the, the channelers, right? And, um, and if you want to do this, you go to special places, there's a lot of drumming, they smoke these big cigars and they drink cachaça, which is sort of like uh, sugar cane distilled alcohol, kind of like rum. Um, and they receive them and you ask them questions, you know, is, am I going to be loved by Joe or not? Or, you know, what's going on? Am I going to become, uh, am I going to travel? Am I not going to travel? Where am I going? Anyway, you ask questions about life and supposedly they get the spirits and they respond. So these ladies are very important. They are the high priestesses of this, of this rite, which is sometimes called candomblé, sometimes called macumba. Depends who you talk to. Anyway, so uh, my parents loved to give parties. And one day my father announced that he was going to give a fancy, fancy dinner party to a lot of Portuguese immigrants. So it turns out that in the mid-70s there was a uh, left-wing coup in Portugal, and all the aristocracy and the upper, uh, <clears throat> upper class kind of moved out, and a lot of them came to Brazil, a lot of them came to Rio, and a lot of them became clients with my father, patients in my father's clinic. So it says, we're going to have this fancy uh, party, and I'm going to, you know, we're going to cook Portuguese food and show them that we can do it better. And I'm like, okay. So, so he does, he invites the Minister of Justice, ex-Minister of Justice of Portugal, it's sort of like uh, the Attorney General of, of Portugal and a bunch of other people, and, um, and he serves whiskey, you know, to this guy. And then, so he's drinking, he takes a sip and says, oh, Isaac, I'm, I'm really sorry, but this is not whiskey. And he's like, what do you mean? Oh, no, this is tea. And my father said, what? So he drinks, you know, and it was tea. So then he goes to the liquor cabinet somewhere in the back of the house, and every open bottle that had an amber color liquid was tea. All, all the different kinds of whiskeys, all the cognacs, all the rums, everything that was opened was tea. He was horrified, and he knew exactly what happened. It wasn't me. I wasn't that kind of teenager, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> but um, it was the cook. So we had the cook, and the cook happened to be a high priestess of the Macumba, called Maria. So she was always drunk, pretty much, because in a sense, that gave her, the ch opened the channels, you know, to receive the spirits, I guess. It made it just easier, right, to, to do that. 
So she basically drank everything that he had, right? And, he was, and so he goes to the kitchen, and this lady, you have to understand, she was in her mid-50s. She was very, very dignified because she was a high priestess, very important person with a white turban on her face. And she would cook those black beans, you know, and she would spend hours going like this. And you could see she was swaying with kind of cachaça and rum. And whiskey. But the beans were awesome, delicious. You know, I don't know what she did there, but they were beautiful. So my father says, Maria, you did this. And she was completely, you know, relaxed about it. He said, yes, I did it. I had to drink it. I drank it. And my father said, well, tomorrow you leave this house. You're fired. And then she looks at my father. And I'm right behind him. And she looks at me. And she tells my father right on his face, says, I'm going to leave. But something's going to happen to this house. She cursed us. My father, being the guy with the garlic on his pocket, was horrified. But didn't say anything, opened another bottle of whiskey, which is sealed, gave it, to the, gave it to his guests, and everything was fine. Nothing happened for about a month. And we forgot about it. Now, I have to tell you a little bit about my house. So there was a dining table, dining room with a big dining table. And one side of it, so imagine there's a big dining table. One side of it, there was this huge crystal uh, closet a closet with crystal uh, uh, doors, crystal shelves, and in each shelf there are all these beautiful bohemian crystal glasses that my parents have gotten when they got married, so they were like 50, 60 years old, right? they were antiques at the time, and there were three shelves of those things, and then the dining room table, and then the other side, there was one of those, you know those trolleys for drinks? They had like a glass top as well, with like fancy bottles, of alcohol, like, like port, and then there is little silver necklace thing saying port or, you know, mint, liquor. So that was covered with that. So two sides. So I was studying math for my, my, my exams, and I felt very uneasy in my bedroom, which was in the back of the house. I moved in quickly, for some reason I do not know, to the dining room. And I'm just standing there which is something you don't do unless you're going to eat. And it was, it was like middle of the afternoon. And I look at the, the crystal closet, you know, with the big, uh, with, the, with the shelves like this. The top shelf cracks. And the whole thing cascades down, like with this horrendous noise, like crashing. Can you imagine, like three shelves of beautiful bohemian crystal glasses destroyed? And... Literally, seconds later, I looked to the left, and the top shelf of the trolley cart also cracks. And the whole thing goes down, and all those bottles of port, and the, the whole thing is destroyed. So, boom, boom, right? And I was just petrified, looking at that thing. What goes on here? How is this even possible? Because you start to think, you know, well, if it's just that one, that's okay, you know, it's very high humidity in Rio. Maybe the wooden pegs that held the crystal shelves together got, got weak and rotten and the top. But the synchronicity of the two of them happening almost at the same time. And the theme is alcohol, right? I mean, it could have been something else, right? Nobody was that. Nothing else broke in the house. So I called my father in his office, which was three blocks away, and I said, Dad, she did it, you know, come home. So he comes home and he's horrified. The new cook that we had just hired looked at that thing, knew the story that we fired the, the other lady, knew the story, knew the other lady, left that day. <laughs> she said, this house, I'm not staying here. Now, I forgot to tell one thing about this story. The day that Maria left, the morning after, my father discovered, she looked at me and asked me to help her carry her luggage down. And she did, and, and, and I did, but she held me by my shoulders, looked right me in the eye, and I was horrified and really scared. And she looks at me and she says, you boy, you boy, you have a, a closed body, so nothing will do you harm. So a closed body means corpo fechado in Portuguese, means Somehow you have some kind of protection against evil spirits, which I said, that's cool, great, you know. Um, and that was my interaction with her, and I never understood what happened, 
right? It is one of the biggest mysteries in my life. And of course, becoming a scientist, um, I thought about this a lot. I said, okay, let's, let's reason about this, right? And say, well, maybe it was a supersonic airplane that just went through the sky and uh, you know, broke the sound barrier and that creates all these vibrations in the air and that could you know, resonate with the crystal. There was no sonic boom because you hear it, right? A sonic boom, I don't know if you ever heard one, but it's loud, you can hear it. Earthquakes, there are no earthquakes in Rio, you know. Um, some construction work pounding because, you know, in physics there's this, this uh, beautiful phenomenon called resonance that if you have a vibration of a certain kind, you know, things that can resonate that will also vibrate. If you ever tune the guitar, you know exactly what I mean. You, you, you hold one string and the others will vibrate if they are in tune. That's a resonance effect, right? Nothing made sense. And then I thought to myself, maybe she hypnotized me. You know, maybe when she looked at me, she hypnotized me, and I did it. You know, I went there, and I broke it. Well, if that happened, I could not possibly remember doing anything. You know, I remember being in the middle, looking one way, looking the other way, and I certainly don't have super powerful eyes, you know. Um, I'm not Cyclops from the X-Men that can actually do these things. So, honestly, I do not know what happened, but it did happen. Right? And this is a true story. And I tell it because having spent, you know, 30 years of my life researching very technical mathematical physics, you know, about the Big Bang and black holes and, and the era of time and other, other topics, this sort of phenomenon kind of defies a whole worldview, you know. And to me, when I was 17, that was a very complex moment because I was, as Pam said very well, my father was completely against me going into physics. She told the exact story. He did ask, he did tell me, who's gonna pay you to count stars? You know, and um, so in 94, when I got a, a prize from the White House with President Clinton, when the White House was still white, you know, it's kind of turned a little yellow. Um, anyways, I. You know, I, uh, my father was like, you see, you worked hard, you deserve that. So that was his way of saying, I said, yeah, the President of the United States pay me to count stars, how cool is that, you know? <laughs> so, so the thing is that um, it was a blow to my whole worldview because I had been a very mystical teenager. You know, one of the things that I tell in, in some of my books is that my mother died when I was six years old and that was a real blow, as you can imagine. And so I always had this fascination with time and loss and also with the idea that there is something beyond reality, you know, something that is just beyond the knowable that could perhaps be a door to another dimension. And so before I could actually understand what I was thinking about, I was very attracted to Gothic literature. So I would spend weeks reading Edgar Allan Poe and Bram Stoker and Mary Shelley and all those guys and then I'll go to all the horror movies because I was trying to figure out time and death and so when I became a teenager and I understood that wait there's another way of dealing with these issues which is through science you know science actually does think about what is time and how time flows and even if it doesn't give you a complete picture of it it gives you a very interesting picture of it so I went into that and I was getting, you know, to when I was 15, 16, 17, pretty much trying to frame myself within the rational approach to knowledge that is necessary for science. And then this happened. The witch happened. And then you're like, whoa, right? I mean, how do I deal with this? How do I fit something like that into this rational vision of reality? So somehow, as the years passed, I realized that... Um, there are different ways of thinking about the world, that you should not limit yourself to just one way, that we humans are very complex creatures. You know, we are, in a sense, a paradox, because in one hand, we are animals, right? I mean, we are animals, we need to eat, we need to secrete, we need to reproduce, and we have all the characteristics that animals do. But on the other hand, we have this amazing self-awareness, you know, we, we have this ability to conceive the sublime and 
to imagine the infinite. And how do you deal with these two things? You know, like you have to do that, but then you have to eat because you're hungry, your stomach is bothering you. So there is this physical reality of us, and there is this mind, abstract, metaphysical reality of us that makes us a mystery. So I th somehow started to realize that, and I also realized that even science, science really is a flirt with the unknown. If you think about it, right, what's, a, what's science, right? Well, science is, is this methodology for us to deal with the world and try to understand the material aspects of reality, right? Yeah, right, but how does that go? How do we do that? Well, we look beyond what we can see, right, if you think about it. So, for example, us here, right, you guys, you're all seeing me right now. That means that there is light that is hitting me, that is reflecting on my body, that is traveling to you at uh, 186,000 miles per second. That, by the way, means that when you see me, you're seeing me one billionth of a second in the past. So the notion that we have of the now, the present, is really a fabrication of our brain. It doesn't exist. If you think of it, that everything that we conceive of reality as being collected by our senses, right, and being collected by our senses, the vision, hearing, touch, if we collect all of that in the brain, the brain uses all this information and sort of constructs a way of thinking about, yep, I'm here, this is the real world, and I can understand what's going on. But that is not the real world. That is a very tiny fraction of what's going on right now. Because right now, there are all sorts of stuff happening in this room that we're just not aware of. We are not aware of if you only look at reality with our senses. For example, you are all glowing in the infrared because it turns out that at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, our bodies, right, unless you have a fever, I hope nobody does, then you glow even more, which is kind of, in a sense, a compensation. You know, it's like, well, I'm sick, but I'm glowing more than you are, ha, huh? you know? But, so if I could have infrared goggles, I would see you all glowing like little stars, you know? But we don't see that. All the AM and FM radio stations in Woodstock, okay, not that many, but the ones that get here, <laughs> also have radio waves, which are also electromagnetic waves. They're also uh, a different kind of light that is invisible to the eye, but not, not for that reason less real. They're filling up this room. This room is filled with radiation we don't see. It's kind of like what the fox said to the little prince when she's talking about love. And she has the famous quote in the little prince that says, you know, the essential, what is essential is invisible to the eye. Well, that is what science is about. Science is looking at what is essential, but is invisible to the eye. You know, the science of Newton and Galileo, the old, the old science, that was the visible to the eye. You know, it was about, ah, the planets are here, let's track their orbits, or this ball is rolling down the hill, let's look at that. So that is the science of everyday life, the science, but that's way, we're way beyond that now. Now we, do, we deal with the science of the invisible, you know, the science of what's out there and we don't know. Here's a beautiful example that I always like to, to mention. You know, the sun, since Green Meadows is all about our planet, and I'm very much about our planet too, the sun is our absolute and fundamental source of everything, right? Now, to, do, to be that, the sun has to fuse hydrogen into helium at the heart of the sun at a temperature of about 15 million degrees. And when it does that, it produces these particles called neutrinos. Now neutrinos, as the name says, they are small, they are kind of like small neutrons. You know, remember the neutrons that appear in the, nucle in the, in the nucleus of the atomic, uh, of the atoms, the neutron does not have an electric charge. 
So these particles, they were conjectured by, by Wolfgang Pauli to exist, and it took a long time for them to be discovered. And the name neutrino came from Enrico Fermi, you know, Italian. And he says, ah, piccolo neutrona neutrino. So <laughs> that's the name of the, the neutrinos. And, and the beautiful thing about these neutrinos, they're called ghost particles. Why they're called ghost particles? Not because they have anything to do with ghosts. Hold your horses. But because they go through everything, almost without interacting. So neutrinos can go across the whole planet Earth and not have one single collision with any atom that it, that it goes through. It just flies right through it, okay? So when the sun produces its energy by turning hydrogen into helium, it produces gazillions of neutrinos that travel from the heart of the sun all over space. Right now, in this room, per second, each one of you is being hit by over a trillion, that's a one with 12 zeros, neutrinos coming from the heart of the sun. So this is all happening, but we don't know about it because we don't have a neutrino detector in our bodies, right? But there is this deep bridge between the heart of the sun and each one of us made by these ghost particles. They are connecting you know, us in many ways, right? And this has nothing to do with pseudoscience and neutrino healing and oh God knows what. This has to do with the very, very fundamental physics of the sun. And we don't see it because it's in the invisible realm, right? So science is this flirt with the unknown and the invisible. And in one of my books called The Island of Knowledge, I built this metaphor about how knowledge evolves, right? And the idea is very simple. It's like this, let's, uh, let's imagine that everything that we know about the world fits in an island, okay? Now, of course, as we learn more about the world, the island grows, right? And so it's been growing, but as any good island, this island is surrounded by an ocean. And this ocean is the ocean of the unknown. So knowledge is surrounded by the unknown, right? Now, here comes the paradox of knowledge, which is the following. People would say, hey, you know, if you're a logical positivist, if you believe that science will triumph and solve all the problems, you would say, hey, just give us enough time and money, right, because science needs funding. We'll just keep growing. This island is just going to keep growing, and this ocean of the unknown is going to disappear. That belief, which is a belief which is promulgated quite a lot by lots of my eminent friends included, is completely wrong. And the way it actually goes is like this. When the island grows, the boundaries between the known and the unknown also grow. The more we learn about reality, the more we know about the world out there, and the world in here, the more questions we are able to ask that we couldn't even conceive of beforehand. So the paradox of knowledge is that it creates knowledge, yes, but it also creates new questions. And in a sense, as long as we have curiosity and this passion for knowledge, we will always have questions to ask. So there is never going to be a final theory of everything. That is a complete, that is just philosophically wrong because we don't even know what the questions are. How can you possibly say, yes, we are going to unify all forces of nature in a final theory of everything. Just give us time. We're almost there. When I started my career, we we're almost there. My PhD thesis was about almost there. And it's been 30 plus years. And we can't do it. And it took me all this time to realize that, of course, you can't do it, dummy. Because that is not how science and knowledge advances. And I'll give you an example. Just think of this. Um, biology, before and after the microscope. So in the late 17th century, right, people had a conception of what was life. And then Van Leeuwenhoek in, in the Netherlands invented this instrument that could actually look at something small and magnify it, right? The opposite of the telescope, right? The telescope is bringing something from far away 
and the microscope is looking at something small and magnifying it, and he realized that in a drop of water, there are countless little living things. They were, again, invisible to the eye. So because of that instrument, the conception of what is life changed completely because then the questions became, is there a limit to how small life can be? And how do we know? And how can we go from non-life to life? What is the origin of life? You know, people had no idea. And still, well, we're, we're a little better now, but we still don't have, certainly don't have a final answer to that question. And so the history of knowledge is such that as we create new instruments, as we create new knowledge, new technologies, we begin to ask new questions about reality that we didn't before. To give a more present example, AI. Everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, right? I mean, that's the thing. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, will machines take over humanity? And what are you going to do about that? Can we do something about that? Because, you know, computers are getting faster and faster. They are beating everybody in chess and in jeopardy and you name it. You know, now it's open poker. I mean, seriously. Um, so does that mean these machines are intelligent? Are they going to threaten us? Well, I can tell you this. The machines that do all these things and the machines that we use to kind of improve our algorithms and the machines that Google uses to know exactly what kind of things you want to buy, so they put it right in front of you. So you're going, I don't want to buy it today, but you then go into Amazon and you buy it or something. Um, those are not intelligent. They are self-learning, but they are not intelligent in the sense of they will threaten or become a conscious mind. So there's a huge difference between those machines and conscious minds, right? And so we do need to be very careful about how we go with these machines and what sort of ethical consequences they have and way, way before they become intelligent or conscious, if that's even possible, that will be a completely different conversation. You know, my, my opinion is that they cannot. And that's actually something I also address in the island of knowledge. But we have some many more down-to-earth serious issues related to automation and to uh, digitalization of the, of the marketplace. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs in the next 10 years or so. Just to give you ex an example, um, there are about 3.5 million truck drivers in the United States, and Mercedes-Benz already has an 18-wheeler that is completely self-driving, that is driving around the roads of Nevada and Arizona. And the, the guy is just sitting there. All he, he or she can do is push the button to stop it in case of an emergency, but there is no real reason. So the question becomes, what will happen to all these people when all the cars and all the trucks and all the cab drivers and all the Ubers and the Lyfts and the school buses are self-driving? You know, we're talking tens of millions of people. You know, and they're in their 40s, their 50s. They're not going to train to write code in Unix or in, you know, in, in Ajax or HTML you know, at that point. They may not want to. So these are sort of more down-to-earth questions that definitely are happening. But back to the boundaries issues, one thing that I would like to close with is to say that we talked about the known, we talked about the unknown, which is what feeds our curiosity, right? I mean, Tom Stoppard in Arcadia, which is one of my favorite plays ever, he says something like, is wanting to know that makes us matter. And that, to me, is the motto of my life. You know, it is wanting to know that makes us matter. Because when you stop wanting to know, what's left? Right? Einstein said um, that the most profound emotion we could feel is the mysterious, with a capital M. He says, it is the mysterious that is at the birth of all creativity in the arts and the sciences. Note that he puts together the arts and the sciences, our relationship with this mysterious. And the person who cannot get emotionally moved by this connection with the mysterious, he says, is as good as dead. A snuffed out can candle, he, he, he actually says. 
So that to me is extremely important, you know, to understand that when you look at the world, there are different ways of looking at the same question. That is why my institute brings humanists and scientists to talk about big questions of ethics and philosophy and science, you know, questions that you cannot look at from a single perspective. You really need to combine different ways of thinking, you know. And of course, in the middle of the ocean of the unknown, and this is really important, there are all these bits, these regions of the unknowable. So there are very fundamental questions you can ask about the world that we just cannot answer. We cannot answer them scientifically, at least. So just to give you a couple of examples, one very profound and one more practical. One very profound is the origin of the universe. Science as we know it right now cannot possibly answer how the universe came to be in a complete way. All we can do is construct models, right? That's what science does. We build models, right? Models are simplified renditions of reality, right? So it's sort of the difference between the map and the territory. Science is the map. The territory is reality, right? We do not know all of reality. All we can do is construct these maps which are as any map is, incomplete, right? No map can give you complete information of the place, right? They're always like sort of subtracted, they're compact. There's this very, very wonderful short story by Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian writer who is one of my heroes. It's a one paragraph story, which is just amazing. And the story goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a kingdom where the emperor wanted his geographers to make the most perfect map of the kingdom. So the geographers worked, created maps, but never very good, never very perfect. So they increased the maps. They became bigger and more detailed, bigger and more detailed, bigger and more detailed, until at the end, the perfect map was as big as the territory, which was useless, right? I mean, that's not what a map is for, right? But that is what science is. Science is a map to reality. It is not reality. So when we deal with questions about the origin of everything, we can't do it through science because in order to even build a model in science, you have to assume all sorts of things. You have to assume what is energy, what is space, what is time, why is energy conserved? There is a whole baggage, right? A whole sort of ideas that have to come together for you to come up with a model about the origin of the universe. So whenever you, you hear very famous scientists like Stephen Hawking and not so famous ones like uh, Lawrence Krauss and Neil deGrasse Tyson say that we have solved the problem of the origin of the universe and hence God is dead, that is complete nonsense. It shouldn't even be said. You know? It's actually irresponsible. Right? And one of the things that I do is try to explain to people why that's irresponsible. Now, now you know. You know, because it gives people the false idea of this scientific triumphalism that yes, science is going to solve all problems, and that is just wrong from a philosophical perspective, now we all know, and it's bad from a sociological perspective because it disrespects people's faith across the world, and there are six billion people, there are believers out there for a reason, many different kinds of reasons, right? And it creates this it increases the antagonism between science and religion instead of bringing people together or trying to bring people closer to one another. Not the extremes. The extreme of one and the extreme of the other can't deal with that. You know, if something is a, someone is a biblical literalist, is as bad as a radical atheist. We just, this, these opinions are formed and you can't deal with it. But the others, you know, which are hopefully most, are open to this conversation, and this conversation is extremely important now because it's a conversation that will deal with the big moral questions of our times. Like, for example, who decides um, what will happen with artificial intelligence? Who decides what's going to happen with genetic engineering when maybe in 20 years from now, or even less, we'll be able to go to a clinic with a menu 
and say, I want my kid to have these, these, and these characteristics. Well, only the people that can afford it, first of all, will be able to do that. And so you start to create this science, science fiction dystopia where you're going to have a, a, a small enclave of alphas, you know, they are able to do these things, they're able to access the information and use, make use of it, and the rest of the world who cannot. So who's going to decide? What kind of legislation is going to deal with this, right? So these are complicated questions for our time, and this is the moment in time for us to understand that it is coming together <clears throat> as a species and not as a bunch of different tribes that we're going to actually make some progress or could make some progress in the ways of the world, including our planetary survival. Because, folks, Earth has been here for 4.5 billion years. Okay? It will be here with us and without us. We, on the other hand, evolved to live in a very specific set of circumstances. And we need these circumstances to survive. So if we mess it up, we are the ones that are going to pay the price. You know? So this is, to me, the moment to wake up and to take it really seriously that we have issues of technology which are very important, but we have issues of value, of tribalism, of entrenchment, which are also very important. And the only way that we can get beyond that is if we step away from our entrenched tribal values and look at humanity as a single species in a very precarious planet. Because that's the only way that we can value who we are and the planet that we live in and the animals that we share our space with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so, Pam, how should we do this? Should we? 10:51. Uh, <laughs> quick questions and quick answers. That gentleman there, speak real loud so that we can all hear, please. extrapolation of various radiation curves. Nobody has a thermometer that can measure 15 degrees. You said automation is going to replace everybody. I'm also a programmer. All previous automation has led to more jobs. So how do we deal, I mean, you dealt with it quite a bit, but I appreciate this. How do we deal with scientists and engineers who come out and say, the world is going to be up so we don't know what their assumptions are. We don't know what their models are. Or we do, but they're extrapolating largely and making huge social pronouncements. So how, do we, how as responsible engineers, engineers and physicists, do we interact with society and how does society not turn science into a religion? Good. Yes, you should not turn science into a religion. That's for sure. That's, although some scientists would love that. There will be a lot of popes out there. <laughs> That's for sure. um, who is the real pope? Um, well, I would say that um, the only way we can do this is by respecting the scientific methodology, by actually looking at the data and being really honest about what the data is saying. You know? and, and I think you're, you're talking mostly about climate change. Am I correct? Uh -huh, I gotcha. Yeah, so I think in that case, um, the difficulty there for most people to understand is that the, the climate is a very complex question, obviously. The world is very big. There are many different variations. And, and so there are global trends and there are local trends. And most of the uh, statements that we can make are statistical by nature. You know, you cannot possibly say that in the third Monday of January of the year 2024, there's going to be a massive flood in the Ottaquichi River. You just can't do that. There is no such thing. It's not like the orbit of the Earth around the sun. You know, it's, it's, a, it's not a mechanical deterministic system. It's a mechanical deterministic but statistical system with many variables in. 
So what we do is we make statistical inferences based on the data. And the way to believe in that is the same way that um, you believe when you read something about a medical study that says that, you know, we looked at thousands of people and we covered all possible uh, variables and all possible fake correlations. And once we eliminate all those fake correlations, what's left is this conclusion. And that's exactly what has been done with these climate models. So there is data collected all over the world at different, at different altitudes. And people make plots, graphs of the accumulation of CO2 on the atmosphere since about the 1850s to nowadays in parts per million. And they look how that goes. And if you look at the plot, it's kind of flat, flat, flat. And then around 1950, 1960, it starts to, 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 to go up. And it goes up a lot, right, since the last 50 years. And then you look at the global average temperature. And you see that obviously it's a very different scale. We're talking about fractions of a degree. But you see the same exact trend. And then you look at the sun and you see how much radiation is coming out of the sun. Is it changing? Is it the sun that is causing this? No. Is it earth coming from, is it radiation or gases coming from the inside of the earth that is causing this? No. So you start to eliminate, is it a new kind of heat age? Because, you know, earth has gone through ice ages and heat ages, yes. But it's definitely not happening, and these changes happen in thousands and thousands of years, not in a few decades. So you're left with the inescapable conclusion to most serious scientists in the world that not just the world is changing in terms of its climate, but that the change is mostly man-made, you know. And it's kind of like, to me, it's obvious, you know, but it's sort of in the, in the winter, if you're cold, you put a blanket on, right? So it was going to be a short answer, it's becoming a longer, because I'm very passionate about this issue. So, so you put a blanket on, and what does the blanket do? It keeps your heat closer to your body. It doesn't give you heat, right? It keeps your, the heat that you have closer to your body. But if that's not enough, you put what? Another blanket on. Now with two blankets on, you're good. So you're trapping your heat real well, right next to your body. Well, the same thing is happening with the sun. The sun is producing this heat, it's heating the surface of the atmosphere. The way the radiation comes is in one sp specific kind of infrared and ultraviolet. Once it hits the, the surface of the Earth and is, is, is reflected up, it's degraded into a different kind of infrared radiation that is mostly trapped by clouds. So it's the blanket. So the thicker your atmosphere is, the thicker your blanket is, and the surface gets hotter, just like your body gets hotter. I mean. It is not much more complicated than that. Or if you want another idea, go park your car in a hot day under the sun. A lot of heat comes up, comes in. Not all of it goes out. The inside of the car gets hot. I mean, seriously. And then, of course, this is sort of the basic thing. And then you go and, and you, and you qualif quantify that with data. So I would say that... Um, People that are skeptical about climate, climate change have to be very, very careful about who the skeptical, uh, where the skeptical opinions are coming from. Who are these people and, and, and what purpose are they serving? Because at the end of the day, honestly, even if you do not believe in man-made climate change, you should believe in our planet. It doesn't really matter if you don't believe that the world is getting hotter because you have to respect this home because this is the only home we have. So irrespective of climate change problems, which are very serious indeed, the love for nature and for this planet should trump everything else, you know. And that's... That's it? Okay. Pam is shooing me out. Okay. We'll be back. Thank you very much, folks.